May the words of my mouth and the meditations of your heart, of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Do not let your hearts be troubled. Come on, Jesus. How can our hearts not be troubled? His heart was indeed troubled at times. Why else would he have come to live as one of us? He knew that the world was and is struggling with what it means to be who we were created to be. He knew that it is so hard to be human. For us, those who are learning and practicing what it means to be fully human in the way that Jesus has modeled for us, it is difficult to not wallow in the troubles of our hearts. It is difficult to let the troubles of our hearts support our growth rather than cause us to be paralyzed, demoralized, or fatalistic. What do we do with our troubled hearts as we go to the place we do not know? Through this pandemic, how do we allow the grace in our troubled hearts to lead us to be connected to the one in whom we are called to dwell? In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. When I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me so that where I am, you will be too. Usually when I preach this text, it's at a funeral. And I use my, if you didn't notice, I use my blended translation employing the King James Version, which I normally have no use for, but in this case, I use this blended version to draw attention to the expansiveness and abundance of God's hospitality towards us. In that setting, in a funeral, people are concerned about the well-being of their loved one who has gone on to glory. The assembly gathered always ponders their own mortality, the choices they've made in life and lost opportunities. Hoping, believing, and wondering, is there more to this life? This funeral text also serves well for the funeral of the church as we know it. Perhaps better said, it can be seen as a text for the resurrection of the church if we look for it to carry us into the future. This is not just a pastoral text meaning, meant to give us comfort when we're facing the most difficult times of death, dying, and the life that comes afterwards. In this text, Jesus reminds us that being in the presence of God and eternal life is a journey, a journey as God's people, a journey of community, a journey of the body of Christ empowered by the Holy Spirit and on a mission from God. Ours is a journey to the embodiment of the abundance of the, div of the divine. And Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled Believe in God, believe also in me. Trust in God, trust also in me. Oh, sisters and brothers, our faith is really being put to the test these days. We are finding out in new ways what it means to love as Christ loves, ways that are pushing us to have very uncomfortable conversations in a challenging time. And from our reading from 1 Peter, it's written, but you are the ones chosen, but you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you, from nothing to something, from rejected 
to accept it. As more states weigh the cost of opening up, even though COVID-19 continues to claim more lives, churches are faced with the pressure to do what the government allows. We are living in a time when being a royal priesthood is at odds with being a citizen of capitalism. It might seem confusing when we have thought and been taught for so long that capitalism does not conflict with our Christian values and moral responsibilities as followers of Jesus. But is it really confusion? How many of you remember blaming your mother for not letting you do something or go somewhere when you didn't want to take responsibility for a hard decision? I remember wanting to have the approval and acceptance of others, or when I thought of, or when I thought a relationship was too fragile to make room for difference. I remember not wanting to feel the loneliness and vulnerability of being different and wanting to belong. And as I learned to make difficult decisions, I remember telling my mother, I'm confused, to which she would respond, you aren't confused. You know what to do. You just have to do it. And Jesus said, you know the way to the place I'm going. And Thomas asked, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? What way? What choices lead us to a full realization of God's abundant, many-mansioned hospitality? I'm reminded of the Underground Railroad. It wasn't really a place, but a community of people making and being the way that new life and justice could live and thrive. <clears throat> Risks were taken only to save lives not to support the slave economy that had been built up and that had built up our nation. The state and law said slavery was good for society. Most churches, including the Episcopal Church, under the leadership of the first Bishop of Vermont, who at the time was presiding bishop, followed the law of the land and upheld the institution of slavery. Their faith was put to the test when the nation was being asked to choose people over the economy. It wasn't and isn't an either or choice, but it is a choice which requires death to business as usual to make way for a new resurrected life. What way, what choices lead to a full realization a beloved community? What way and what choices lead us to a full realization of new life, love, and justice? The way there is through our imitation of Jesus. And Jesus did not just talk and teach about his mission. <clears throat> no, Jesus lived and embodied his mission by having and showing compassion, touching, healing, praying, feeding, including, blessing, teaching, forgiving, standing up for and with the rejected, the forgotten, and the outsider. Jesus lived and embodied his mission by going against the status quo, having and expressing anger at abusive systems and calling for their change by feeling the pain of others, by being a revolutionary. Jesus lived and embodied his mission by making and living hard decisions, sacrificing, loving, loving, and loving some more. As we remain in our homes, we are not able to use all of the means that we know and love to do the work and mission we're called to but there is so much we can do now. 
This time has planted the seeds in us for our future ministry. As we wait in our homes, we are called to discernment. Love continues to cultivate how we are and will continue to be beloved community. So my friends, do not let your hearts be troubled about where we are going because we know the way, the truth, and the life.